It's the first visit by a Japanese Prime Minister to Russia in 10 years. Shinzo Abe is in Moscow pledging to expand business ties worth billions of dollars. But a long-running dispute over a chain of islands could derail the talks. This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Jane Dutton. It is a dispute that's hung over two of the world's most powerful nations for more than 60 years. The question of who owns four small islands in the Pacific have prevented Japan and Russia from signing a peace treaty, formally ending the Second World War. They're known as the Northern Territories in Japan and the Southern Karelias in Russia. Leaders from the two countries are meeting in Moscow for the first time in 10 years, and they've promised to restart talks on settling this long-running dispute. But with billions of dollars at stake, will trade take priority over territory? Japan is the largest importer of liquefied nat natural gas in the world, and it can give Russia the money and technology to develop its underpopulated eastern region. Japanese-Russian relations are developing in a progressive, positive way. We've reached a record turnover. However, for countries such as Japan and Russia, it is still relatively small, in my opinion. I am certain that we will discuss our key problems today, including the peace treaty between Russia and Japan. We will also discuss some major issues on the region in general. The potential for our cooperation has not been explored enough yet. Improving the level of cooperation between our partner countries is a necessity of time. This is not only part of the national interest of the two countries, but will also help the stability and well-being of our region as well as the world in general. On the basis of this point of view, I would like to exchange opinions with you today in a slow and friendly manner. Now, Japan's Prime Minister has taken a delegation of more than 120 business leaders with him to Russia. That is the biggest ever economic mission to the country. Trade turnover between Russia and Japan hit $32 billion last year, a 5.3% increase on the year before. And the volume of trade is expected to increase this year. Figures from January and February show a 6% increase on the same period last year. Now, most of that trade is from mineral resources, which account for 80% of Russia's exports to Japan. For more on this topic, I'm joined by three guests from Beijing, Stephanie kleiner Albrandt, Project Director on Northeast Asia for the International Crisis Group, and a specialist on Chinese foreign policy from Moscow, Dmitry Babic, a political analyst who writes for Russia Profile magazine, and also joining us from the Russian capital. On the phone, Tomohiko Taniguchi, Cabinet Secretariat at the Prime Minister's office. Taniguchi is currently travelling with the Japanese Prime Minister to Moscow. Welcome to all of you. Let's start off with you then, Mr. Tomohiko. What is your Prime Minister doing there? What is it that he hopes to achieve? I've just come out of the press conference that you have heard. Uh, not just Prime Minister Abe, but also President Putin, they, were, uh, they, were, they look very much upbeat. And they're saying that uh, they have succeeded in taking back the ownership of the negotiation that was in no man's hands for many, many years. And they said they would uh, accelerate the process. Um, so it's going to be an approach uh, not of um, uh, uh, bottom-up, but of a top-down. I think that's as much as what uh, both leaders pledged uh, before the uh, press. What sort of reception has your Prime Minister received there? And, and are they getting on? Do they have much common ground other than the issues that need to be resolved? Because both countries have uh, failed to sign the peace treaty for many, many years. Um, I think the um, expectation has been uh, low, but uh, they have succeeded in um, issuing a statement, joint statement, uh, which indicates the uh, degree of um, keenness and, uh, uh, you know, uh, enthusiasm on the part of the Russian, uh, on the part of the Russian leader. And President Putin, uh, in answering uh, difficult questions, repeatedly said that uh, it's going to be us, I mean, the both leaders, that have to solve unsolvable 
question. I suppose it's relatively easy to express how keen you are, but it's, it's translating that into any sort of action that's going to really be the challenge, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't disagree with you. And uh, neither one of those uh, leaders uh, said that uh, uh, they, can they can solve the problem uh, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Uh, but uh, they mentioned that they're going to meet uh, more frequently down the road within this year and the next. In the next year, President Putin has agreed uh, to come to Japan in return. And so um, uh, that's the uh, – both countries have just uh, uh, agreed to restart, reboot the process, if you like. Dimitri, do you think the challenges are to rebooting relations? And uh, how does it make you feel seeing those two leaders sitting there? Do you think that this could be could, – could this be the time for change? Uh, well, I think that uh, uh, it's, it's possible to resolve the problem if uh, we don't try to solve it in a year or two years. Russia's strategy has been uh, that uh, Russia and Japan should develop economic cooperation and cultural cooperation, cooperation in all fields, uh, laying aside uh, the territorial problem for time being. I mean, Russia acknowledges that such a problem exists. But we don't want it to spoil uh, the context right now. And uh, I think if uh, the developments follow the Chinese model, China also had a very bitter di territorial dispute with Russia uh, during the 70s and the 80s. Uh, but this problem has been resolved. Uh, because China was, uh, you know, China uh, used a soft approach. It did not demand that Russia give up the territories right now. It uh, developed friendly relationship with Moscow, and little by little the problem was solved. Uh, the Japanese approach, which looks very much like the approach of the hawks uh, in the Republican Party in the United States, or, you know, uh, people hostile to Russia in the Eastern Europe, you know, Poles or Hungarians, uh, you know, that policy of no concessions to Moscow, it actually led nowhere, because uh, the islands are still in Russia, and uh, Russia has shown during the last 20 years that this uh, situation can continue indefinitely uh, unless Japan makes some steps uh, trying to indeed improve relations uh, with Moscow. Stephanie, do you think that it is down to Japan, this standoff, and it's what many describe as its belligerent attitude when it comes to these islands and territorial disputes? I actually think that um, looking at this issue going forward, that there's a sort of an elephant in the room that might gently nudge both sides towards really implementing this, this sort of ideal of putting the dispute aside and trying to pursue economic relations in, um, in hopes of coming up with a solution later, and that's China. Um, although you've you know, seen last month we had Xi Jinping's first visit to a foreign country, he went to Moscow. There was a joint agreement, there was talk of strategic cooperation, but it's no secret that relations between China and Russia are shaky, um, and there are a lot of tensions in that relationship, including uh, those over the Far East, over China's role in Central Asia, and simply the fact that China now is, has four times the GDP as Russia, twice the military, and so I think Russia is uh, reticent to depend that much on China. From Japan's side, uh, I think it's quite clear that they have had a lot of problems in dealing with China, particularly since September, the purchase of the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands, and the response from China, which has been um, seen as very assertive, the establishment of overlapping administration. And I think that you, know, you can just look at where Abe has visited since he's come into power. In contrast with when he was in power before, when he first visited China, he's now traveled to many countries in, uh, in, in Southeast Asia. Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, the U.S., now Russia. I think he's trying to bolster his uh, economic and political relationships with these countries before visiting China and trying to, uh, to you know, balance out uh, China's influence. Uh, China overtook uh, Japan as the second largest economy in 2010. This was seen as a, a big shock in Japan. Um, in many ways, Japan really does have to cooperate with other countries in the region and with Russia. Okay, let me put that question to both Tomohiko and Dimitri, starting first with you, Tomohiko. I mean, is that what this is all about, is the background to this, the threat of the rising China? I understand there is a way to interpret the uh, bilateral relationship that's going on between Russia and Japan, just as you have heard from Stephanie and Beijing. Uh, as, uh, I've heard a lot of uh, interpretations like that. 
uh, with or without China, this is important, with or without China, Russia and Japan have had this dispute for six decades, more than six decades, and it's so unusual for Russia and Japan to have no peace treaty whatsoever. So that's the thing that President Putin and Prime Minister Abe have agreed to tackle using their sheer personal capacities. I think that's the... Uh, but, but surely a positive spin-off of at. resolving this territorial dispute will be that they can stand side by side and possibly contain, if that's the correct word, China. Um, it's going to be very much surprising if you hear anything like containment from either leader, President Putin, or Prime Minister Abe. Uh, rather, uh, Japanese side has been very much interested in moving this um, uh, process forward to have the peace treaty, a simple and pure, with Russia. And uh, during the course, um, we, they have agreed to uh, agreed to uh, a plan that would take a little bit of uh, concessions. From either side. That's um, uh, what uh, President Putin and Prime Minister Abe has said. Okay, Dimitri, do you believe that it's all about this peace treaty or is China, as Stephanie described it, the white elephant there? Uh, well, I think that uh, Japan is a bit jealous of China's success in its relationship with Russia because despite uh, numerous contradictions uh, that our colleague has just mentioned, on the surface, relations between Russia and China are much better than Russia's relations with the United States or with the European Union. Uh, and it's a paradox because actually there is a lot more ground for disputes between Russia and China than between Russia and the European Union. So how basically, wo How worried do you think uh, Russia think is about what's happening in Siberia and the growing Chinese presence there and the fact that China is eyeing their rather delectable raw products? Well, no, well, uh, uh, that actually, there are not many Chinese in the Russian Far East. Uh, and uh, this is a legend spread by the, mostly by the U.S. media. Uh, because if there had been many Chinese in the Far East, Russia has a very small population there. Then if you come to Vladivostok or any small town uh, in the Russian Far East, every fourth or third person would be Chinese if there were one million Chinese there. That's not the case. Just travel there and you will see that uh, Chinese are still a very small minority there. So uh, the Russian Far East is facing a lot of economic challenges, uh, but there is no overpopulation of uh, Chinese migrants. That's a myth spread by the United States, which is naturally interested in, uh, you know, straining relations between Russia and China. In this triangle, Russia, China, and the United States, all three uh, poles of this triangle are interested in the other two poles having a conflict. And in the current situation, when the United States is increasing pressure on China, everyone understands that the ABM missiles, for example, which are located in Alaska now and in other parts of uh, the American Pacific, uh, these uh, ABM missiles are not directed against North Korea. They are mostly aimed at neutralizing China's nuclear potential. Everyone understands that. So in this situation, uh, Russia suddenly becomes an important player. Uh, and uh, Russia is obviously interested in getting into this game and probably improving its relations with Japan, uh, because Japan is not interested in confrontation. Okay. And Japan uh, may need Russia both as an energy source and as a very important player in normalizing its relations in chi with China, probably. OK, and as Tomohiko was saying, he believes it's really about these Kuril's islands. They have been the subject of a 60-year dispute between Russia and Japan. They stretch north from the Japanese island of Hokkaido to the southern tip of Russia's Kamchatka Peninsula. And it's these four islands, which Russia calls the southern Kurils and Japan, the northern territories, that are the center of the dispute. A memorial in the center of Vladivostok to mark the Russian fallen in the Second World War a war that never ended with Japan. The two countries didn't sign a peace treaty. This chain of islands is the reason. The Russians call them the Southern Kurils. The Japanese call them the Northern Territories. The battle for them is now being fought on the diplomatic front. 
During his term as Russian president, Dmitry Medvedev caused a deep freeze with Tokyo when he visited the islands in 2010. The Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe knows the chances of a diplomatic breakthrough with President Putin over control of the islands are slim. Any resolution of the dispute, though, would mark a turning point for the city of Vladivostok. A loose translation of its name means ruler of the east, but that's far from an accurate description in present-day terms of trade. Nearly 80% of the commercial production of Vladivostok comes from exploiting the resources of the Sea of Japan. The loss of the rich fishing grounds around the Kuril Islands would seriously dent the economy here. A straw poll we conducted on the seafront showed the people in the far east of Russia were strongly opposed to any concessions. We've already given away our territory Alaska. I don't think we should give up these islands. We have huge resources. It's pointless to give them away. Why should we? All our sea products come from there. We will starve if we give them up. They're not starving here at the moment, though. Japanese sushi bars have taken the city by storm. But whose fish are they? David Chater, Al Jazeera, Vladivostok. Tomohika, maybe you can answer David's question there. Whose fish are they? That's an interesting question. <laughs> but uh, all uh, these issues involve huge amount of emotional uh, uh, responses. Um, one interesting answer President Putin gave at the press conference this afternoon is, um, we're not going to deal with those emotional questions. We're going to, we're going to be practical, and we're going to be uh, uh, doing uh, our utmost to find a solution acceptable for both parties. Um, so uh, I, I think that's an encouraging remark. This issue has to be solved, and it will take concessions from both sides, and they have agreed to make concessions with each other. Okay, well, maybe they've agreed to make concessions, but, Stephanie, I don't know if you were aware of what the what the Russians were saying there, and they just said that they're not willing to make any concessions. So how difficult is it going to be to reach any way forward? I think that essentially the way forward is um, to look at the mutual economic interests that Japan and uh, Russia have. Russia needs to develop the Far East. Uh, what Dmitry says is correct. There's a lot of paranoia about uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese migration into the area. But if you just look at the numbers, you know, you have one person per 1.3 kilometers in the Russian Far East, 7.5 million people. Right across the border, there's 70 million Chinese. So there's that, there's fears based on the numbers. And there's a need to develop that area. And I think that Russia is really looking for other countries besides China to do that for these reasons. There is a lot of fear in Russia, by the way, not only in the United States about this. You see it on social websites, etc. But I think that um, that's one of the things that Russia needs to turn to Japan for. Of course, natural gas from Russia, which was previously going to the U.S., is now being offset by U.S. shale gas, which has been discovered. So Russia would be very keen to be able to sell more gas to Japan. And Japan has a lot of interest in um, diversifying a lot of its economic trade that previously was going to China. There has been discussion of every time a factory is open to China, a factory should be open somewhere else in the region. So generally speaking, some of these disputes, it's very difficult to see in the short term how you can come up with uh, an immediate resolution. They really just have to be managed to a certain extent. Joint uh, development can, can be undertaken, but you need confidence on both sides to do that, and you need a basis for both sides to agree that there needs to be compromises made. And sometimes you find this in a mutually beneficial economic and political relationship, such as the one that you see now that could develop between Russia and China, partly due to both sides' concerns about China sorry, between Russia and Japan, partly due to both sides' concerns about the growing political and um, economic role of China. Because, Tomohiko, I should imagine that there, there is real concern in the region of, of some sort of resources race. I mean, could that lead to an arms race, something that the volatile region clearly can't benefit from? I think that's a far-fetched question. It's uh, simple arithmetic. Japan needs more natural uh, gas uh, because uh, Japanese um, uh, nuclear plants, electric electricity generating plants have been 
put into the hall, uh, the majority of which has been uh, put, in, put into the hall. So Japan uh, desperately needs natural gas from all uh, sources, and Russia is uh, one of the biggest uh, sources uh, for natural gas. That's uh, as simple as that. I think the point uh, of uh, this bilateral uh, summit is uh, that both leaders have decided not so much uh, to uh, look back uh, at the past, and they have uh, chosen to concentrate their attentions in looking at the future. And as uh, Stephanie says, uh, the first step, uh, the important step, has to be uh, started in the economic field, and that's been evinced by the uh, number, sheer number of uh, business leaders that uh, Prime Minister Abe has taken uh, to Russia, 100-plus uh, uh, leaders. And there have been a number of uh, uh, coming case and uh, MOUs, um, uh, MOUs signed between uh, Japanese financial uh, uh, institutions, uh, counterparts in Russia, and so on. Dimitri, how important is energy to Russia's foreign policy at the moment? Well, indeed, it is important uh, because this is one of the few ways uh, in which we can improve our relationship with both China and Japan. But the reason why Russia is so keen about keeping the Kura Islands is mostly psychological. Uh, the problem could be solved, I think, peacefully uh, back in the early 90s if uh, Japan and the United States had more fantasy and if they had tried to uh, create some sort of an alliance with China. <laughs> But uh, well, with Russia, I'm sorry. Uh, but since uh, the policy of both uh, Japan and the United States was uh, at best cautious about Russia, I think that opportunity has been squandered. Although there were various. Do you think the U.S. Uh, is a little bit nervous at the variants. moment, watching what's going on? Uh, well, uh, I'm not sure, although the United States certainly played on this uh, South Kura uh, problem. Uh, they tended to support the Japanese position, although the United States and Russia were allies in the Second World War. And uh, these islands were taken by Russia with uh, actually with American help, because America has destroyed the uh, Japanese military force on most of the Pacific. Uh, but the United States was rather on the side of Japan in this dispute. Uh, but, uh, you know, there were lots of variants. For example, Russia suggested giving up two small islands and keeping the other two big ones uh, as a first step that was not accepted. Uh, Japan stood firm on its position that all four islands should be given uh, back to Japan. So it was uh, politically unacceptable for Yeltsin and later for Putin to give up these territories simply because there was so much noise about it. Uh, with the territorial dispute with China, there was no such new noise. Let, let me quickly throw that to resolved. Stephanie. I mean, Stephanie, th this is something that really dominates issues in the region, isn't it? These territorial disputes. I mean, is it all about territory? Is it about natural resources? And how important is it that they all get resolved? Um, well, with regard to the territorial dispute between Russia and China, um, there is some concern, I think, about the Chinese have actually never accepted the treaty um, that settled that the Far East has went to Russia in the 1800s. And I think that there's some concern that that might be something that uh, the Chinese might want to revisit. Um, as Dimitri said, there, was, there were concessions made in the 80s, and there were a lot of border disputes resolved. But unfortunately, um, some of those agreements are not looked on favorably today. Uh, some Chinese are saying that they felt that um, perhaps too many concessions were made and maybe some of those things should be reopened. So I think that um, territorial disputes in the region, although some of them have been settled, and I think that China, some of the concessions that it made and the way in which it did resolve some of these territorial disputes, uh, you know, 20, 20 years ago, can be seen as a model. Um, but unfortunately, as China continues to rise, I think it's revisiting the strategy that it, that okay, it endorsed Stephanie, at that time. I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut you off there because we have yeah. run out of time. Let's take a look at the response we've been getting on our Facebook page. Pepoy Medina says the road to peace and stability is only through diplomacy. Rashid Khan says they are talking to each other. Nobody's making any threats. Maybe diplomacy is on the cards. Good. And Thomas Henner adds both countries need to have diplomatic ties. Thereafter, they can reconcile for the sake of peace and unity.
So thank you very much in Beijing, Stephanie Kleiner Elbrandt in Moscow, Dmitry Babich also in Moscow, Tomohiko Taniguchi, and thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. If you want to, you can send us your feedback. Just email your thoughts to us at InsideStory at aljazeera.net. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Jane Dutton. Goodbye for now.